Welcome to another exciting Bible study with Rev. Dr. James A. Duncan, pastor of Shiloh Baptist Church. Faith study in the Word is designed to keep you fired up about your walk with the Lord. Fired up about our faith study in the Word with Pastor Duncan, author, teacher, and long-term educator with a burning desire to see every believer live a full life of faith in the redeeming power of God. This can only happen when we develop a hunger and thirst for studying the Word, God's Word. Thanks for joining us in tonight's study. Good evening, everyone. Uh, good morning. Whenever you see this, this is Pastor Duncan. And I'm getting ready to go into a very, very, very timely and important Bible study. As of right now at this recording, we have passed the mark of over 300,000 people dead from coronavirus. That's astounding. Can you think about all the families during this holiday season who are going to have empty places at the table? empty holes in your heart. They're going to be struggling to get through this season. Now, the Bible study I'm about to do, when I embarked on it, I did not know it was going to have this kind of response. But people everywhere are dealing with depression and discouragement, and these are just some discouraging times. So we want to make sure you understand how God works during times of depression and discouragement it's really, really, really our only hope. So I need you to make sure that you like, share, let somebody know. This is an important Bible study. This is part two of battling through depression and discouragement. And in this part, I deal with God still works in depression. It's so important that I remind you of this. God still works. Stay tuned for this exciting study. Pray for those families. And we will pray for each one of you. Thank you again for tuning in. God bless. Good evening and welcome to another Fired Up About Our Faith Bible Study. Did you catch that? Fired Up About Our Faith. In times like these, only faith is going to keep us. Only faith is going to make your life work. You can't go by what you see. You got to go by what you know. This is Pastor Duncan saying welcome to part two of this exciting Bible study, battling the spirits of discouragement and depression. This evening's installment, part two, is entitled God Still Works Even in Depression. I want to start out this evening by letting you know, did you know that depression is one of the most common ailments in our country. There are a lot of depression knows no age category, knows no racial boundaries, knows no economic, demographic, or status. Depression hits everyone. Discouragement hits everyone. Dark times hit everyone. As a matter of fact, depression is a common mental health condition. Look what I just said. Mental health. Wake up somebody. You're going to catch this. You're going to love where we're going tonight. This is a mental health condition that causes symptoms of being sad or profoundly lonely. It hits everybody, no matter what background. But here's what I want you to see. See these statistics. Right now, over 17.3 million American adults, or about 7.1% of U.S. population age 18 and older, have some sort of major depressive event every year. Major depressive disorder is more prevalent in women than it is in men. And over 1.9 million children, 3 to 17, have been diagnosed with depression. Now my question to you is, some of them got to be Christians. Don't you think out of the 17 million, there's a saint in there somewhere? Don't you think out of the 1.9 million, there's a, a Christian child growing up in a church? How do we get so crazy? How do we as a church do such a disservice by making it seem like if you have to deal with mental health, that it's a weakness or there's a stigma to mental health? Man, if we were to tell the truth, a lot of people would get some relief because we would tell the truth that there's a whole lot of days we're battling. How many know? I don't want nobody to know what's going on in my mind some days. I am struggling. 
Can I tell you one of the, one of the times when I struggled the worst? I just got done preaching, and especially when church was in. And man, we're high in the anointing. I've been studying all week, and the message has been laid clear in my heart by the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, I let, you know, I, I teach that message, and there's a profound response from that message. And I'm sitting there going, wow, and everything's high. And then all of a sudden, I come down, and as soon as I do, there's this. There's this feeling. I know other pastors or other people know what I'm talking about. It's like that, that feeling that goes down where you got to build yourself back up. Not a tiredness. There's that feeling of making sure you understand what it was about, what the worth is, what, what's going on. And sometimes what snaps me back is when I get home and I'm back in the family and, you know, and then Marcia orders me around or uh, one of my children calls and say, Dad, can I... And all of a sudden, I find myself back into reality with a purpose again. We're going to talk about tonight the reality of depression. Look what I just said there. The church is not exempt from depression. The church is not exempt. Um, when we walk and preach and talk like we as Christians are exempt, we're going to find ourselves in the same condition of the biblical character that I'm going to show you tonight. And just to show you that depression is real scripturally, the psalmist, and not just David, there were the psalms, a lot of David's psalms, you know, psalms are written in, there are four books of psalms, right? I mean, excuse me, five books of psalms, and in that fourth book are the penitential, the, the, uh, the penitentiary uh, psalms where someone is, uh, you know, repenting to God. And somehow this psalm, Psalms 102, got into the penitentiary psalms when it really, I, I didn't see any place that it was, uh, there was a repentance. If you look in your Bible, it actually says, a psalm for a young man who is afflicted. Just the fact, and we believe that man was David. Some writers believe it was David. But if you look, there is a mention of the temple in here. So some people say it could be a young man that actually was part of the captivity. But that aside, look at the clear words of someone who knows and loves God who is going through that struggle of depression. The psalmist said, told you the title was the prayer of someone who's afflicted and overwhelmed. And he poured out this complaint to God, right? And here's what he says. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come unto you. Hide not thy face from me in a day when I am in trouble. Incline thy ear unto me in a day when I call. Answer me. I'm going to read you several verses so you can follow me. Go to Psalms 102. For my days are consumed like smoke, and my bones are burned as a hearth. My heart is smitten and withered like grass, so that I forgot to eat my bread. Are you kidding? Those are... Typical symptoms of someone depressed. Internal agony. Uh, the, the symbolism of my days are consumed like smoke. My, bur my bones are burned as a heart. My heart is smitten with it like grass. I even lost my appetite. This psalmist said, I know you, God, but there are days when I deal with it. A struggle. So I'm telling my brother and sister, you're not alone. Let's keep going. There's another psalm, Psalm 61 and 2. I'm only going to read a couple of verses so we can legitimize the fact that don't let anybody tell you you're weird or something wrong with you because you're dealing with depression. No, when you face it, then you can figure out that God still works, even in my darkest time. I'll say that again. God still works. So don't lose me as I'm going through these scriptures. God is still working in your life. Watch this. From the end of the earth, I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to a rock that is higher than I. God, you got to get me out of this. My heart is breaking. My, uh, I'm laying in bed. I'm not sleeping. I'm, I'm walking around. I'm in a conversation, but I'm not in a conversation. Uh, my mind is here, but my mind is there. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to keep my sanity. I say a hallelujah or thank you Jesus and I say all that stuff and nothing's calming that spirit within me, that spirit within me, that depression and discouragement that enveloped this psalmist. Psalms 143 and 3. 
excuse me, 143 and 4. Therefore, my spirit, here's another symptom, is overwhelmed within me. My heart is appalled with me. Uh, I get to the point that I'm so overwhelmed that I, I turn on myself. I'm appalled with my existence. This, this is some real stuff that we go through. I know you're saying that's for somebody else, not for me. But you trust Apostle Paul? Look what Apostle Paul said. This is this Old Testament. In the New Testament, in 2 Corinthians 1 and 8. For we would not, brethren, have you to be ignorant of the trouble which came to us in Asia. Look what he said. We were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired for our even, our very life. He was serving God, but he found himself in a situation where he was pressed above his ability or the strength that was in him. But he survived. And I'm going to tell you how he survived. But don't act like we can't get there. And so I'm going to give you the last one. Even Jesus, our Savior, here is our hope. Jesus said to us, I know what's going to happen to you. I know you're going to be one of my best servants. I know you're going to struggle. I know you're trying to, you know, hide it. But he said, here's what you need to do when these spirits attack you. Jesus said, Matthew 11, 28 and 29, come unto me, all that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I need you to know, I can teach this without this board. But the reason I'm teaching this, when you come to Bible study, I want you to write this down. The Bible said as you put the word in your spirit, something will happen. So the first thing you understand is Jesus himself said, come to me. When you get to this point, that means you're going to get there. When you get to that point, come to me. What, what point, God? When you get to the point that your spirit is over, look what he said. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. Try me and lowly in heart, and you should find rest for your soul. A yoke is God is saying, you know what a yoke is. I don't want to go into elementary teaching, but when they yoke together two animals, um, it's a heavy yoke, and it, it, you're, you're yoked to something, you know, some kind of burden. So he said, look, instead of worrying about that, come to me, take that yoke off, put on my yoke. God said, what's my yoke? Learn about me. My word will bring relief to your spirit. So instead of sitting there stewing and worrying and letting your worry just keep going over and over, God said, come to me. Learn about me. When you learn about me, will you put my yoke on? What is my yoke? Being obedient to Christ, trusting God, having faith in God, uh, believing God can make a difference, walking around knowing that if I can just get to God, I'm going to be okay. I'm telling someone, you're going to be okay if you can just get to God. Right? So Jesus said, so what am I trying to tell you? Get some help. I'm not a clinical psychologist. I'm not. Uh, I have a lot of training in a whole lot of areas, and I've been pastoring a long time. But I will tell you, there's some things that is just beyond my ability to help you. Not beyond God's, but my ability to deliver. So God has to send you to someone who can deliver. So here is the order, so you know what this teaching about, for you to get help. First thing you got to do is go to God. Seek ye first. Kingdom of God. His righteousness. And everything else will follow. So, I don't care what anybody tells you, uh, go to God first. God is the only infallible source. God is the only one that can't fail. When you go to God, here's what I think God will tell you to do. He will tell you, Go to a doctor. <laughs> Listen to me. I, I was thinking about this, and I, I said last week how we equate. If we get sick, we'll go to the doctor. We don't think that's a burden, and we, we don't think that's strange. There's no stigma for me going to get help, or, you know, some men have stigmas and don't go. But most of us got a lot of common sense, and we know I got to go get an exam so, you know, I don't die from something that could have been prevented. How come you don't think the same way with your mental health? And when you go, the doctor gives you a pill. If the doctor gives you a blood pressure pill, you take it because you don't want your, you know, want your kidneys to go out. You don't want to have a stroke. How come you don't want to go somewhere and get the knowledge God has given someone? God told you to seek wisdom and seek knowledge. Let me tell you what happened to me as I was putting this study together. It sounds crazy. But I'm saved. You say, well, I'm saved. So I shouldn't need all that. Today I was sitting there and I got up uh, as I was studying, had my 
laptop on the table, jumped up, I grabbed something, a glass of juice or something, and I went to sit back down. I banged my knee on that wooden table. And I don't know about you, a lot of people act like, you know, this is why I told you I didn't believe in professional wrestling and all that stuff. I get hit, I stop for a minute. I have to deal with it. And I remember doing this to my knee. Oh, there was pain. Wait a minute. If my knee had been really hurt, I would have went to the doctor. How come me being saved didn't stop me from hurting my knee? That's how silly it is. For you to know being saved, being a child of God, does not exempt you from having to battle through your times of discouragement and depression. Matthew 6, 30, but seek ye first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all these things shall be added. Right? So we got to seek God first because he's the first one. You can't play. Oh, you know what? I didn't do this because I talked about it, but I said, get some man knowledge and get you some medication <laughs> if you need it. I'll move on. That's part of man's knowledge. But you can't play. There's some serious complications to untreated depression. What are they, Pastor? Look, major depressive disorders, persistent depressive disorders, bipolar depressive disorders, seasonal depressive disorders, psychotic depressive disorders. You can't read one scripture and get rid of that. You can't pray one prayer or sing a song and get rid of that. I may not be able to equip you, but God said... I'm able to work in any of these. I can heal you totally, wholly, and God is not above using knowledge and medication to do so. Now let's get into this study because here is the order of our study. My study is clear. God is our first and only, I got good news. God is our first and only infallible source. I can go to a man, he can prescribe the wrong medication. So somebody tell you, I like that preacher. He's telling us to go get some pills. No, I'm not. I'm saying go to God first and follow his instruction. A doctor can give you the wrong pill. They can give you the wrong advice. But if you go to God, he's the one who will protect you and make sure that you're being taken care of. So God, I'm going to show you how to reach God. How God makes sure with even something as devastating as depression and discouragement, mental issues, that we got to go to God. This is serious, people. As you sit there and stew and don't get help, God is saying, why are you going through that when I provided you some relief? He works in the darkest times of our life. Right here is when an old preacher would say, can I get an amen? I guess I'm one of those preachers. Because right there, I need someone to say, I don't know how. I got through that struggle I was in without God. We will look at those who are depressed and discouraged in the Bible. I gave you a list last week. Uh, Elisha, Jonah, David, uh, Apostle Paul went to the Lord and said, take this thorn out of my flesh three times. Uh, Saul, uh, Hannah, I could just name them. They were all depressed. Solomon, you know, the wisest man. He said all is bad. Everybody has to battle. That's where I want you to start. Go with me. Understand, everyone has to battle. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to see the cause of depression to help us identify and avoid it. So we'll look at how the biblical character, what were the circumstances in the context of their depression, so we can figure out, is that some of the same things that are oppressing me? Then we're going to look at how God delivered so we can get some biblical principles that we can apply to our situation. So this study is going to be a look first at the biblical character. We're going to see how could someone who was so triumphant, so victorious, knew God so strongly, how could they go through this the same way you and I do? Then we're going to find out how God delivered them and the biblical principles. And then lastly, we're going to show the power of God to help through anything. So... If I have one of those people, you know, the little angel, and you're writing everything down, I'll say it again. We're going to first look at the cause. Then we're going to look at how God delivered, get some principles, biblical principles. Then we're going to look at how the power of God turned the situation around. And God can turn your situation around. Yea, God, follow me. This is serious. So first of all, I want to establish some spiritual groundwork. 
no matter what any doctor tells you or anybody else tells you, all mental stress and emotional attacks are spiritual in nature. And therefore, spiritual warfare is inevitable. It is a battle for our very existence. We have to fight. Somebody here knows what it means to get a diagnosis. Because, you know, I went over last week, and I'm not going to do that now, what was some of the, you know, someone who's fighting a major disease is prone. Someone who's been to PST, PST, PTSD, someone who's been through some kind of stressful situation. All of those situations can somehow get you to the point that you are more open to falling into discouragement or depression. So it's spiritual. How do I know? Ephesians 6, 12. Talking about children of God. We wrestle not against our flesh and blood. Quit blaming yourself. Quit saying I must be weak. I must got a shortcoming. No, it's just the plight of us down here on this sinful earth. We have to learn how to battle through. It's the conditions we're living in, pandemic all around us, bad news coming from the television, seeing folk die, can't reach out and touch anybody. You know we miss not touching each other. Do you know being a church boy from way back, I miss the corporate worship service. Come on, I'm not by myself. I know we always say God is good. He is good, but I sure wish I could get back in the church because there are things that are relieved in that atmosphere that God does, that blesses us. As you can see, we are spirit, soul, and body. So you need to understand, this is how we get attacked. Our spirit is, in, in the Hebrew, it's the ra'u, or the rock of God. That's our spirit. It's the part of us that's the candle of the Lord. It's the part of us that touches God. Then there is the pneuma in the Greek. It's the same thing in our speech. God blew the breath into a man and we became a living soul or a living spirit. This is the immaterial part of us that relates to God. This is that powerful part of us. This is that part of us that straightens us out. This is that spirit man standing up fighting when my flesh is trying to wrestle with me. My spirit man gets back on top. Then we're soul. Here's important. That's where we get our word psyche from, right? The psyche, uh, the, the, the study of the mind, psychology. We know that our soul uh, is uh, the part of us where our intelligence, our emotions, our desires. Here is what I'm going to tell you. Everybody in here, I don't care how straight they look, I don't care how good they look, don't let it fool you. All of us have had some days where our emotions were out of balance. Can I get amen? How many of us know there's some days when I don't know why fear will come from nowhere? So, you know, and I know we hear all these messages, you shouldn't fear. I even preach them. I'm preaching them so we have something to fight with. But the reality is there's going to be some days we battle through fear. There's going to be some days we battle. The key is to battle through and to be prepared for it. I'm teaching this lesson so when it comes, you're not shocked. Because I know I'm just dealing with another spiritual battle. Tell somebody that. Holy Spirit, just enlighten me. Tell somebody you're just dealing with another spiritual battle. Another spirit. Depression. Discouragement. Fear. All those spirits come to dominate you, but they're not of God, and we can overcome. But we have to quit acting like we shouldn't fight the battle. And then our body, our flesh. You know, we spend a whole lot of time in the physical realm. We dress this thing up, we brush teeth, and we do hair when I had hair. There was nothing like going to the barbershop, coming in, got a fresh cut. I don't have to worry about that no more. I get a fresh cut every day. Anyway. And so you know what I mean, a fresh hairdo, uh, look at your nails, uh, you know, we go work out, we lift weights, we do all this stuff for the body. But God is saying, put just as much time in your soul or your mind so you can handle it. Because our body will break down, that flesh will turn on you quickly. Uh, what are some of the experiences, conditions in our life that participate, that precipitate discouragement? Here's our first biblical character we're going to look at tonight. This is where it gets real good. The first call, somebody need to write this down. Fatigue from overwork and or stress and a depletion of emotional energy. Uh, emotional and spiritual energy, I'll say. When you lose that emotional or spiritual energy, it's when... Whatever you're in has overcome you, and now no matter how many, you know, thank you Jesus, or glory to God, or everything you say, until you get that spiritual energy back on track, God is telling us there is a biblical character we're going to look at.
who went through this, and we're going to tell you what they did that caused them so much pain and so many problems. 1 Kings 19. Now, on my board, I have three and four, but I'm going to actually read to you a little bit more of the text. I'm going to start at verse 1. So where we're picking up the text, Elisha, this powerful prophet of God, Elisha who showed up, who had an attitude. You know, Elisha is the one, it's not going to rain, and it didn't rain. Elisha is the one that God had, you got all the stuff that had happened to Elisha before. Now we come to this 19th chapter. This is what happened. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he killed and the prophets, all the prophets with sword. So Jezebel sent a message to Elisha to say, may God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. All right, so we had just come from chapter 18, that powerful um, battle at Mount Carmel. Remember, Elisha said, if God be God, serve him. If Baal be God, serve Baal, follow him. There was a contest where Elisha showed up, the prophets of Baal. Jezebel was going, Elisha took all of those 400 prophets, got them together, just little Elisha was standing there, and then he had a contest, and he said, the God that answers by fire. And to show people off, he not only talked about the God, because you got to remember, all God's people had been falling prey to idolatry, they were serving other gods, and they had the nerve to think that their other gods were just as strong as God. Isn't this somehow, something how the devil can pull us back to something that is inconsistent, that is not real, that doesn't work just because it pleases our flesh. And God's people kept going back and forth and back. So if you understand this text, we find out that after that battle, Jezebel now says, I'm going to do the same to you. So out of everything that happened to Elisha, he now found himself Elisha was afraid. Hmm. Powerful prophet. One that can call down God. What you afraid of? Same thing you and I get afraid of. We got to refocus. We got to not allow what we see to disconnect us from what we know. You know and I know God is powerful enough. But when you get to the position that you are depressed or you are under an obvious weight of constant going, doing, going, doing. You lost your spiritual energy and your emotional energy. Remember I told you Elisha was alone up against those prophets of Baal. He was standing up there for God. And you know the text. You know the story. He ran and came to Beersheba. Then another thing we do when we get to this depressed state. He left the servant and went on alone. Sometimes you do nonsensical things when you're depressed. You, I don't want to be bothered. You know you need some help. The enemy tricks us into getting all by ourselves so we can have a great big pity party. You're sitting there now, I'm all alone. And you know what? This pandemic will keep you alone. You'll be sitting in that house thinking of all kind of jacked up stuff in your life, leaving the praise of God behind when you need to shake it up, bring God back. But we tell them, Leave your servant. I want to be alone. Sometimes we do that out of anger, out of the disconcerting nature of depression, how it separates us from thinking straight. Once we're caught in that blank, and I'm talking to somebody, you're sitting here now, you get up and you fake it during the day, act like everything's okay, and then you sling back and let that depression grab you. That's right, I'm talking to you. I'm not just making this up. I'm going to share something with you as we go forward. Look, while he himself on a day's journey in the wilderness, left his servant, went further in the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, 
it got so bad that he wanted to commit suicide. He said, I have had enough, Lord. He said, take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Wow. Lesson one we learn from Elisha. Lesson says, this happens even, lesson one is, this happens even your pursuit of spiritual goals, you need to get some rest. What this should say, bad by bad top, in the lesson ones is that depression happens even in your pursuit of spiritual goals, you need to get some rest. Elisha was fighting for God. He had been on the run for God. But even on the run for God does exempt us from needing some spiritual rest. I, I'm one to talk, and I know most pastors are. I've been smacked by my members. My wife has told me, why don't you go sit down? Dad, you need to get some rest. But we got to remember there are times we need rest. 2016 was a tough year. I was doing some, you know, I'm, I'm in there doing a dissertation, and I'm still pastoring, and I, I, I'm all kind of things happened that year. I can't tell you. My, my assistant pastor and I were both out at the same time. I was worried about the church. I found myself dealing with a heaviness and a darkness that I could not shake until I admitted it was there, focused on it, and watched God take me out of it. Look what happened. How did Elisha get there? I'm going to tell you how you think. Now, how some of you think that are sitting there right now? Here's what we think. How could God let this happen to me? He, he did what we do. I'm the one working. It's not fair that I'm going through this. All that I'm giving to God. The first thing we do is, we, he was disappointed. Because God didn't meet his expectations. It's like, God, I shouldn't be going through this now. This is not where I should be. Come on, somebody help me. That's why you're depressed. Because somewhere along the line, you expected more as a child of God than he gave you. And you got on that train or you rode that horse, beat it to death until you were depressed and running around just going through the motions. Secondly, anger and hurt. He was hurt. God, how could you let Jezebel talk to me like that? How could you let me get out in the wilderness? I was just there. Where is your power at now? Not knowing, he cut off God's power. He was angry. First you get your expectations. Then you, get your, then you, then you start getting self-pity. You're angry about where you are. And then the wrong thinking about yourself. You know, I'm the only one. Oh, that's the biggest lie the devil ever told. And I'm sorry, no matter how many times the devil tells it, we still fall for it. I'm the only one. They'll tell you the only one. He'll have you up in the corner somewhere. You can't make it. He won't let you look at the people who are making it. He, he won't let you look at people who are going through and have been through struggles like yours. Or he won't even let you think back unless you take dominion and say, let me think back to all those times I did make it. And you flip that thing around and tell the enemy, no, something wrong with this picture. I'm still here. Hello. That means... I have God's power available to me. But Elisha was so far depressed, he didn't think like that. He was so far gone, he didn't know. So, <clears throat> what happens to us, excuse me, is we get to these conditions where we forget that Jesus told us we're going to have these days. Uh, there was a song by Smokey Robinson and Miracle said, Mama told me there'd be days like this. There'd be days like this. Look. I have told you these things so that in me, right, so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you're going to have trouble. But take heart. I, who, God, I've already overcome what you're going through. First Peter, I like this because what happened to him when he was in that state, that the weapons that the enemy has, don't miss this, the weapons that the enemy has came at him. All of a sudden he was so vulnerable that the threats, and that he made up in his mind. So he felt threatened by something that he had overcome before. So the threats. Uh, Jezebel said, by this time tomorrow, you're going to be like one of my prophets. The threats brought fear. Tex said he was afraid. Once you start buying into the threat, so as soon as you buy the threat, you lost God, and now you're afraid. What are you afraid of right there sitting there listening to me tonight? Well, what is it? Is it sickness? God's a healer. 
Is it the fact that you think you're going crazy? God will give you a spirit of peace. Is it the fact that you're in an uncontrollable situation? There's nothing too hard for God to control. What are you afraid of? You're sitting there telling me you're afraid because you lost your perspective and you're like Elijah. You're in this darkness and you forgot. God still works even in the darkness. Pressure may be something big for man. They got all kind of medicine. They may have to send you five or six doctors. But there's one Dr. Jesus and he can heal. Go to God first. Oh, let me see what Peter said. This is what Peter said about the threats. But even if you should suffer, so that means you are again, for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. Examples of rest. I love this. How do we know this is true? Because Jesus Christ himself told his disciples in Mark 6, 30 and 31, uh, you got to know the context. In Mark 6, he had just sent the disciples out. Well, in, a, in, in, in chapter 6 of Mark, it's, a, it's a, a, a powerful chapter. You know, it starts with Jesus going back to his hometown. And we know what happened there. He could only do a few miracles, right? Then it goes down to uh, with John the Baptist where uh, Herodias heard how, Herod heard how Jesus was going around blessing people and how his fame was growing, the text says. And all of a sudden, he says, is that John the Baptist come back from the dead? Then there's a rehearsing of John the Baptist's death. And we know how that went. He had Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and John the Baptist went to him and said unto him, as, as he went to him, said, um, it's not right for you to have your, your brother's wife. So he was fearful of John the Baptist because of the people, but his wife was so angry. She wanted to do something to him. He couldn't, but he locked him in prison. And then we know that on, uh, there was a day when Herodias' daughter danced for, John, for, her, for Herod, and Herod said, whatever you want, I'll give you. And the mom said, ask for the head of John the Baptist. And he asked for John the Baptist. Said, then it moves into where the disciples had gone out, and they went out. This is a busy chapter. And they went out, and they went out two by two, and it said they cast out many demons, verse 12 said, and they preached to people about getting saved. And when they came back to Jesus, the next thing we're going to see is the feeding of the 5,000 and the walking on water. But these disciples were just going around the world. And, and look what Jesus said to them. He gathered his apostles and said, um, it reported that they had taught all they had taught. And he gathered them and said, then because so many people were coming and going, that he did not have a chance to eat, he said to them, they hadn't had a chance to eat, he said, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. I remember when I was younger, my pastor preached a message from this text. And I'm running fire for God. I didn't want to hear that. And the pastor said, the, Jesus said, come aside and get some rest. But if God is telling us every now and then, you have to stop and get some rest. Right? What God did for Elisha. So we found out that these are what happened with the disciples. Now here's where Elisha is. So Elisha found himself. We're going to get to the nitty gritty. He found himself in the wilderness. He just asked to die. I just told you how he got there. Now let's find out what God did. What are the biblical principles we need to look at? First, God provided for him. The Bible said, after Elisha said, that um, he wanted to die. Let's go to the next part of the text. We find out that God said, the Lord appeared to him and said, the angel of the Lord came and touched him and said, get up, eat. Verse 5, he looked around and there was food sitting there for him. Baked bread over hot coals. What God does is when you're depressed, remember, I'm still providing for you. Remember, God's still providing. That's the one thing we forget, that, that the word of God is still working. Even though you're depressed, you're the one not turning to the provision. And then God told him, now lay down and sleep. I'm providing, but lay down and sleep. Then he protected him. If we're to keep reading, we find out all at once the angel touched him and said, get up, eat. He looked around. 
there was a uh, by his head and there was some baked bread over hot coals. Then the angel came back a second time, touched him and said, get up and eat. Made him some more food. The journey's too much for you. He let him eat. So he got up and ate and drank. Verse 8, then he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horab, the mountain of God. And there he went to cave and spent the night. God protected him while he was sleeping, protected him while he was going through his struggle. Then he refocused him. I love what God did. The Lord appeared. First his angel appeared. Now God appeared. And he said, and the word of the Lord came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elisha? I like that. God is telling me to say to you, what are you doing there in that condition when you have an all-powerful God, able, willing, waiting, ready for you to consult him? He said, what are you doing here in that condition when I'm ready? And then he replied unto him, I've been very jealous of you, God. God said, okay. And after God protected him, he chastised him. I love what God does. He chastised him with a loving hand. He said, okay, okay. And he how God chastised him was he let him, as he was asleep, he told him, go stand in the mouth of the cave. And then, you know, there was thunder and there was lightning, there was noise and God didn't show up. But what God was doing was showing him, look at all my power, how I protected you. Look at how I'm spending time coming to you. Look at how I'm making a way for you. And you're still going to sit there and deny my help in your life? When you're depressed sometimes, then he encouraged him. Because Elisha said, well, I'm the only one. God said, Elisha, I got 7,000 that have not bowed their knee to Baal. I like what God does. After the fire, after the thunder, after the earthquake, and he went back to him, and uh, he called to Elisha again, and he told him, he said, I have... He said, we put the prophets to death, right? And let me go back. Let me go back. So I want to actually give you the verse that you can see it. And God said, um, he said, Lord, I'm the only one that I, 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 I told him how many prophets he had. And then the last thing God did after encouraging him, I got other people that are making it. I want to encourage you. You're not the only one depression. You're not the only one discouraged. Other people are making it. Then he said, he sent him back to work. Isn't it a blessing? He sent him back to work. He said, now go, keep working. Here's how I want to close this lesson tonight. I want to close this lesson by letting you know that the first cause is, even though you're running spiritually, in this pandemic, I'm working more, I'm working harder than I work. Every now and then I find myself slipping off, not, and I got to take a break. First lesson we learned is when you get depressed, God is working. What does God do? Can I, can I recap for you? He provides for you. He protects you. He refocuses you. He chastises you by gentle hands, showing you that you should not ignore him. Then he encourages you. Then he sends you back to work. We're going to look next week. We're going to talk about how God still works. We're going to look at two more biblical characters next week. This is Pastor Duncan saying, I hope you enjoyed this study. Remember, God still works in depression. God bless you. Have a great day.